The 21st century is a time of unprecedented change. We are discovering new and ingenious ways to solve problems that were once thought impossible, like man flight, instant global communication, powerful computation, space flight and advanced medicine. We dream of a brighter future. And let's face it, we all like to be healthy. We generally don't like being sick. We enjoy doing the things that healthy minds and bodies allow us all to do. Though invariably at some stage, we become less physically and mentally capable of doing some of the things that we like to do. Our bodies become less capable of dealing with ailments and we suffer under the burden of disease, the spectre of a thousand faces. We have a choice of mildly prolonging the good life by putting the odds in our favour through a balanced healthy diet, regular exercise and visits to the doctor. History shows that on average, life expectancy has been going up. And there are promising developments in biotechnology and medicine which indicate this trend will continue. However, the fundamental problem of ageing remains. No matter how good we are to our bodies, as a byproduct of ageing, we just wear out, our bodies become less capable of dealing with disease, and our quality of life declines. What would we do if we thought that it was possible to cure ageing within our lifetime? We know there are some animal species that can live a lot longer than humans, like the Galapagos tortoise. Also, some creatures have remarkable regenerative capabilities like the axolotl, capable of repeatedly growing lost limbs, tails, and regenerating severe damage to other organs, even the front part of the brain. Surprisingly, there's also been a successful head transplant on axolotls. In fact, every species is capable of regeneration, from bacteria to humans. Unfortunately, unaided by appropriate treatment, humans are only capable of regenerating to a limited degree, like tissue regeneration. So we see existence proofs of regenerative capabilities in other creatures in nature. So might regenerative therapy be feasible for humans? Before we tackle the feasibility of taking on aging, let's discuss whether it's desirable. Throughout history, cultures from all over the world have stories about the desire to achieve the means to defeat ageing and conquer death. The Fountain of Youth appears almost everywhere in writings in Greece by Herodontus to volumes of Chinese legends, and all the way back to 2100 BC. The ancient Mesopotamian Epic of Gilgamesh, one of the oldest stories ever told. Though these are all, of course, myths and legends. In recent times, we have come to know a lot more about the world and have yet to find an actual fountain of youth. People could be forgiven for thinking that the ravages of old age are inevitable and accepted as just as part of being human, as part of the learning process of growing up, as an inescapable destiny. Seeking comfort from the notion of a slow decline of well-being that ends in death, some are tempted to cope by retreating to the standpoint that it's never going to be feasible, so therefore it's okay to be irrational about whether it is desirable. As a rule of thumb, irrationality is a losing strategy. Stepping back to take an honest look at the immense amount of suffering caused by ageing, it's not okay to be irrational about this. Of course, good health and longer life is desirable like generally reducing suffering and increasing well-being is desirable. In this era of disruption and change, many people's perspectives on ageing are evolving. They see promise in advances in medicine and biotechnology, and in hope look forward to the possibility of having long, healthy lives. So what is ageing? It turns out that people are pretty confused about ageing, so let's look at how ageing and disease are related. The word disease comes from Old French, meaning a lack of ease. And when you break up the word, it makes sense, dis-ease. The word age was imported from Latin into Old French and then into English. Its meaning is close to era, relating to the time somebody has existed. Throughout history, ageing has been related to all sorts of ideas, mystical religious ideas. Ageing is a source of meaning, a social identity, a personal quality or virtue, a foregone conclusion, or even a natural phenomenon which shouldn't be tampered with. This is strange. Aging is sometimes framed as natural and therefore sacred. There are some gaping holes in this reasoning process. The appeal to nature is an informal logical fallacy. The content of the argument fails to support its proposed conclusion. Not only is it difficult to define what natural actually means and where the boundary is between natural and not natural, but obviously that which is found in nature is not always good. 
Would one feel comfortable with endorsing infanticide, mass killings, rape, cannibalism, paraticism, just because we find examples of them in nature? Despite biogerontologists' best efforts, people seem to be under the trance of harboring two paradoxical positions when selectively appealing to nature when aging is brought up, but not when we are talking about natural diseases as byproducts of aging, which should be combated or eradicated. An honest observation of the suffering caused by the diseases of old age invokes unease. Is it ethically acceptable to not do anything about it? Well, the good news is people are doing something about it, though given the scale of the problem it seems there is a huge underinvestment in funding translational research to treat or prevent ageing. So what is meant by ageing is contextual. In the context of the health of the organism, or in a biological context or a medical context, the most appropriate definitions are precise and specific. How ageing has been categorised and defined has influenced the way we think about it. On the one hand we have our chronological age, which refers to the amount of time we've been alive, and on the other hand we have our biological age, which refers to the condition of our bodies. Like cars, bodies eventually wear out, and without maintenance they degrade, fall apart and stop functioning. A side effect of driving our car around is that the tyres bald, the brakes wear down, clutches burn out, radiators and piping leak and develop calcium deposits. If we keep our cars well serviced, giving it regular oil changes, mechanical cleanups and general checkups, our cars are expected to last a lot longer. And if done meticulously, then our cars can last indefinitely, well past the original intended lifespan. In a conceptually similar way, but in a very complex fashion, our bodies wear out, metabolise, malfunction, and eventually just stop working. Should we classify ageing as a disease? If ageing isn't considered a disease, it's easy to consider it as normal and not as a target for treatment. The harsh reality is that chronological ageing and the diseases of biological ageing are highly correlated. Biological ageing will at some stage cause suffering and a lot of it. Fortunately, there's been progress around categorising ageing as a disease. If you can classify ageing as a disease, then you can treat it. The World Health Organisation added a new extension code for ageing-related diseases, defined as those caused by pathological processes which persistently lead to the loss of the organism's adaptation and progress in older ages. This will certainly help to overcome regulatory obstacles to achieving rejuvenation medicine. Why? Well, in the Lancet and Diabetes Endocrinology, there's an editorial published, entitled Opening the Door to Treating Aging as a Disease. As ICD codes are prerequisite for the registration of all new drugs and therapies, the recognition of aging as a pathological process together with the replacement of the ICD codes for senility with old age, represents undeniable progress towards overcoming regulatory obstacles that have thus far hampered the development of therapeutic interventions and preventative strategies targeting ageing and age-related diseases. It is obvious for the most part that we love life so much that we systematically try to avoid injury and death. People have been asking the question, why do we get sick and die? With science, we've been able to pull back the curtains and peer in at what's really going on. We haven't seen any grim reapers or wretched spirits. We have found cause and effect, that our bodies are governed by the same physical laws than the rest of the universe. Aging is a technical problem, and every technical problem has a technical solution. And we've found technical solutions to many diseases over time. And we have a pretty good history of finding technical solutions to debilitating diseases in the past. The byproducts of solving disease is that we get to live happier, healthier and longer, though not indefinitely. Since the object is to achieve quality of life, it's important to highlight the difference between health span and lifespan. Solving some form of cancer or immunizing ourselves against the next strain of pernicious Ebola will only be temporary victories. There will always be more diseases around the corner. So it seems we need to focus on something more fundamental. Interestingly, there's been many recent studies of the effects of therapies on the health span and longevity of mice. A senolytics approach has been shown to reduce age-related dysfunction and extend remaining lifespan by 36% following being administered on old aged mice. The Ocean Biotechnologies Lifespan Study is an interesting example, testing how P53 and P16 proteins in genes affect age-related dysfunction, as they are noteworthy markers for cancer and senescent cells. 
The lifespan study is over six months old now, using cohorts in which gene therapy is deployed against either P16, P53, or both P16 and P53, and there's a control group which are injected with placebo. The mice, which usually live only to three years old, were two years, that is 104 weeks, old at the start of the experiment. The P16 and P53 mice seem to be doing very well indeed, in comparison to their peers. Even though the trial is nowhere yet near finished, the results so far are quite impressive. A concern that people have about living longer lives is that if one were living, say, to 150 years, for most of the latter part of one's life, that would be unbearable, living in an old, sick body. But this is unlikely to be the case, as the reason one could reach such an age is the same reason one would be living in a healthy body until that age. In any case, if you decide that at some stage before reaching 150 years that you don't like life anymore, you can opt for physician-assisted dying or step in front of a truck. But the point is, with working rejuvenation treatments, Chronologically older people need not be living in older, sick bodies, but instead living worthwhile, active, healthy lives. This is important not only from individual perspectives, but also on population levels. Let's take a look at some statistics. According to the World Health Organization, between 2015 and 2050, the proportion of the world's population over 60 years will nearly double from 12 to 22%. By 2020, the number of people aged 60 years and older will outnumber children younger than five. The pace of population aging is much faster than in the past. In 2050, 80% of older people will be living in low and middle income countries. All countries face major challenges to ensure that their health and social systems are ready to make the most of this demographic shift. These stats put things into perspective. It's important to see that health in old age is desirable at population levels. Rejuvenation medicine, repairing the body's ability to cope with stresses or practical reversal of the aging process, will end up being cheaper than traditional medicine based on general indefinite postponement of ill health on population levels, especially in the long run when rejuvenation therapy becomes efficient. It buys so much time to figure out what to do next, how to improve the therapies to address the next wave of issues for individuals as well as on population levels. So obviously, this will not only postpone ill health and expenses for individuals and populations, but also improve general quality of life for everyone. How valuable is the anticipated gain not only for the individual, but for the world? Anticipated health gains over periods that would normally be dominated by ill health means extra productivity and more consumer spending. And then on top of that, the gains of longevity that keep paying dividends in the economic usefulness of expertise gained over long healthy lives and in the general social benefits of wisdom of individuals who have been around for a long time. So back to one of the questions at the start, what might we do if we thought we could cure aging well, let's call it indefinite postponement of ill health associated with aging. The notion of ourselves being around for a lot longer might inspire us to be more concerned with longer term issues and more readily act on things like climate change and maybe trying to avoid thermonuclear war and avoid other global catastrophic risks. So there's an obvious personal and societal financial disincentive to constantly battling the ailments that occur as a byproduct of a worn out body. Instead, it will be cheaper to rejuvenate the bodies periodically into good health. If people's lives are extended, then it also makes sense to have their health span extended. The lifespan of humans has been steadily increasing over the past centuries. But there are reasons that simple extrapolation of past trends is not a great predictor of how a lifespan may change in the future. What anti-aging seeks to ultimately achieve is to reverse fragility, rejuvenate the damage that contributes to sickness, preventing the body from getting frail in the first place, which will, as a side effect, reduce the amount of diseases the body is susceptible to, and also, as a side effect, increase longevity. I wouldn't mind a bit of that. The reality is morbidity is expensive, though if we keep on making progress, eventually, the matter you have the means to make ill health relating to aging optional, and so that's fantastic. 
While at first, unfortunately, anti-aging treatments might be very expensive. However, as our understanding of anti-aging science increases, our engineering techniques improve, and with mass productions we achieve economies of scale, then medicine and therapies will become cheaper. At some point, we'll have the means to create affordable therapies for everyone, which will have an enormous humanitarian impact. Like all other medicine, the production costs of development will ultimately drop. We have no reason to think that this can't be the case for regenerative medicine. If the therapies remain prohibitively expensive, such that only the rich can afford them, it won't be because of the real costs of the development of the therapies remain high. It will be because inflated profit margins are put on top of the real costs of production. Failing to achieve affordable rejuvenation therapy sooner rather than later won't be because it's impossible, it will be because we fail to coordinate and act sooner rather than later. And this goes for the development of the therapies as well as working out the social implications of having the therapies around. True anti-aging is on the horizon of possibility. There are colossal implications for achieving this. Yes, indeed it's going to change everything. But technology always has. Life in the 21st century has always been one of constant change. We don't need to be paralysed by fear. We need sober minds to address the issues such as overpopulation and therapy access, as well as the technical challenges involved in achieving anti-aging therapies. To ultimately solve the problem of aging, we need clarity in thinking about aging itself and practical approaches to mitigating the suffering it causes. If we don't rid ourselves of the diseases of old age, it will be our own fault, not an inescapable destiny. Biological aging isn't an unsolvable problem. We now have access to countless drugs and therapies to heal and cure ailments that were once thought inevitable death sentences. We have solved difficult problems before, and now, more than ever, armed with modern biology theory and advanced tools to aid in science, this is the right time to focus our efforts on the right problems which are often underfunded and under-resourced. To mitigate the risk of becoming complacent, we shouldn't confuse motivation with action. Let's ask ourselves, what are we going to do about it now?